Welcome back, everybody. I decided we'd divide it into two parts. In the second part, we're going to focus more on dogs and wolves and things like that and some of the popular myths. And it's always nice to exchange ideas about that. So um, I know, and me being me, I'll be slightly provocative because I know this has got you into hot water. Um, but one of the things that is talked about a lot in the uh, sort of dog training world is what they call the learning quadrant of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement and positive punishment and neg negative punishment. Um, and I'll let, shall I let you tell the story of, <laughs> of you getting into trouble with this, of what you're trying to say and the way that it was taken? Um, well, actually, I, I, I may have gotten into trouble a number of times on this <laughs> issue. Um, yeah, I, I think, you, you know, this, this quadrant was, it, it's it's a great way of thinking about about behavior, but it's only one way of doing so. And I think um, the problem is the connotations that got attached to those terms. And um, the way also the quadrant is actually uh, understood. Uh, I, I think there's a few problems there. It, 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 you know, and this idea that you can operate in only one of the quadrant and in your all of the others. Uh, okay, so let, let me so ease much. your let me ease your pain because I've I've got I get I'm not afraid to get into hot water and I've got into it. And you know, I I say to our students, you know, people who say that they only use positive reinforcement, that tells me one really important thing about this person: they don't know anything about learning theory, or they don't know very much. Because if you use positive reinforcement, you you know, usually what people mean by that is I don't use physical punishment on the dogs. But if you're using positive reinforcement, you're using negative punishment because if the dog doesn't get the reward, if you withhold the reward from the dog, you are punishing it. And the problem is the word punishment has come to have certain associations. And it goes back to what we were talking about actually in the first part that people like these simple dichotomies, I think. And I think we need to be um, grown up enough for want of a better, I don't want to sound condescending, but a simple term, you know, we need to be grown up enough to actually say, this is what I am doing. Um, I mean, I've just the last few months, I've come in for a lot of flack because of the work we did on shock collars which is now being taken forward to support a ban. And the uh, uh, e-collar industry have hired a group of a PR firm and anybody who cited our work on social media got one of these messages saying, well, you've cited this, but there is this alternative view. Now, one of the people who provided that alternative view, they put a commentary into the paper and we've now given a rebuttal, partly because they've just misunderstood various things. And what we say at the end is, you know, we identify that there are risks. And I think the time has come now with the burden of evidence that those who want to advocate the use of this method of training have to show that it's not harmful because mm -hmm. the field work suggests that it is. And there's also a real, the paper that has caused the um, controversy is one where we decided we're not going to focus on the welfare argument so much. We're going to focus on whether or not, because people say, well, you need to use these collars to train a, a dog to do a recall around sheep. And we got a group of trainers from the APDT in the UK as um, to say, you know, okay, can you train the, the dogs to do the um, recall using positive reinforcement? And yes, they could. And there was, there was no advantages of using an e-collar on the dogs. Mm -hmm. And our point was, well, it's not necessary. And the welfare legislation says you shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering. And, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had Ian Botham, the, the cricketer in this country saying sort of, well, if you ban shot collars, they are, you know, dog, uh, sheep are going to die and dogs are going to be shot as well. Yeah, but that's irresponsible ownership. That's nothing to do with humane training. Um, and it's quite notable that he rehearsed his, his piece in the Daily Telegraph had exactly the arguments that have been provided by this lobbying body. And, you know, he's a cricketer. I respect him as a cricketer. I don't agree with him. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know what welfare is. So, you know, perhaps this conversation, yeah, you know, first of all, punishment is not, does not equal bad. 
I think that's the first thing that people have to realize. And, you know, but at the same time, we can't just say, well, this is punishment and punishment sometimes fine. So therefore extreme forms of punishment are fine. You know, yeah. we've got to, going back to your, your point, and I will shut up and let you talk. And I know this is going to be you talking more than me, but just picking up on what you said in part one, these things are nuanced and people need to appreciate the nuance and not just go for that black and white and I'll shut up. No, it's, it's all good points. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, I, I think, you know, one of the problems is uh, the word punishment, the way it was used by behaviorists, uh, did not have the connotation, like I said earlier, of something necessarily bad. Now, let me explain. Obviously, what I mean by this is that it seems that it has become uh, uh, synonym with coercive or punitive. Now, it can be but it doesn't have to be because all what punishment means is it's something that you do that you know reduces the, the the likelihood the probability the frequency or the duration of behavior that's all it means uh now i think the the issue is also so that's different from saying that you're a force free or stress free or fear free trainer which which i am but you see i think the fundamental problem is that I think we make this about science and we try to make all wrap this up in a science argument, which by the way, if you do that, sometimes science will bite you in the ass. I don't know why we don't have the courage to just say, it's a question of ethics. Absolutely. It's ethics. It's, it's just accept that my ethics is this. I want to be force-free, stress-free, fear-free. Yes, there are some scientific arguments to support this and people like you do wonderful work showing this and that's fantastic. But it's ethics. It's mostly mm. ethics. And fundamentally, it's also, as I say, usually when I talk to people about this in seminars or whatever, what kind of relationship do you want to build with your dog? Yeah. It, it, is it one where you, you dominate, you, you control, you, you, you yell, you, you, whatever it, it is that you know, the, the non-force, free, stress-free, fear-free approach is? Or is it one where you have compa compa companionship where you have mutual respect, uh, love, you know? And, and that's, that's, for me, it's really that simple. Uh, now, if there's science to, to, to push that force-free, fear-free, stress-free agenda, great. So this is, this, is, this is where my science is starting to come in in relation to this as well. So um, yeah, first of all, there is the issue of the efficacy. And again, to say people say, well, punishment doesn't work. Punishment does work, actually. You know, you might well, not that, like it, but punishment does and, work. So let's, let, and, and that's, let's be honest that's what, about this. So, but, so that's, that's what I mean by, you know, science will bite you in the ass. But if that, you try I, to make the point. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I think your point about it's, a, it's about what relationship do you want? And one of the things that about probably about 20 years ago, I gave a talk, I remember at um you for and i sort of presented maslow's hierarchy of needs and converted it to dogs and i, I can remember robert hubrecht saying to me afterwards you know you're well it's basically you're well off the map here what the hell are you on about and actually it's something that has sort of been adopted by the um a lot of the dog fraternity you know that the idea that you've got the basic physiological needs so you know you need food you need water and after that, you know, comes safety, because actually, if you don't get food and water, you're dead. And only if you can acquire food and water, there's an abundance of it, does safety become important, because you want to acquire it in the most safe way. Otherwise, you've got to take risks, because you're going to be dead. And, you know, and you go up the, and, you know, self-actualization, I just, as I say, that's getting the absolute supreme best out of your animal and that will follow if all of the bits underneath are the bricks are in place and the analogy is you know it's one thing for the government to say you know at university you know universities yeah of course we're welcoming or whatever every child's got to fulfill their potential but if the child is worried they're going to get stabbed as soon as they walk out the door if the problem isn't with the universities or the schools it's much lower down that hierarchy we've got to make them feel safe and so one of the things that I've increasingly um, thought about and starting to, to work on is, you know, actually the dogs that we deal with, most of them are 
well, they're overfed, so then I wouldn't say they're fed well, but that is not an issue, you know? Food, water is not an issue. And the most important thing for them is safety. And safety means not just that they're safe in the home, but also that reflects the relationship. Because what a dog, if a dog wants to be able to relax, a dog wants to know that if I'm with you, no harm is gonna happen with me. And I started to use this phrase, the sensitive carer. Um, because a sensitive carer is more than just a, an owner who loves their pet, okay? What, you know, if you think about um, the concept of safety, you know, you've, you've got the safe haven and you've got the secure base. So the safe haven is a place you go to and you know that no harm will happen to you. If you go there, you know, then you can relax. So, you know, if you're in Japan, uh, I think I made this analogy in one of the other talks, you know, if you're in Japan and the tsunami warning goes off, you go to the tsunami shelter and you know that you will be safe regardless of the flooding. And, you know, people don't panic because they know, they know how long it takes for them to get. If they can hear the warning, they know how the distance is. If we had tsunami shelters in this country, people would panic when they heard the uh, alarm simply because they'd probably think that the government had decided to cut a corner and forgotten to order the door yeah whereas in japan things are done really well <laughs> so you know but the idea is you know you go into the kitchen you don't get worried about putting your hand on the hot plate because you know that what you have to do to avoid that harm if you know what you have to do to avoid a harm you don't get stressed about it so that so a safe haven is a place you go to and you know that you're going to be safe the secure base is somewhere that allows you again you know you can explore in a novel environment or things you, you are uncertain and again if some things turn bad you can return to the secure base and there is a safe haven there that if if an owner acts as a safe haven and a secure base then their dog should be able to relax with them because regardless of anything else that is going on around them they know that no harm will happen to them. If you use physical punishment on your dog, how does your dog know that it is safe with you? And you immediately undermine that. And to me, this is why I think it is so important. And that's, we're starting to look at this idea. And the idea of the sensitive carer comes in because again, dealing with some of the dogs that I deal with, with fears, when you look at the literature, and you'll know this probably better than me, but you know, with stuff like attachment, a good carer doesn't ignore their child's needs. You know, when, when I was a kid and I was playing in the garden and I fell out the tree and I'd go crying to my mum, she would kiss my knee and then say, kiss it better and now you can go off and play. And what she did there and what a sensitive carer does is they acknowledge your distress and then show you it's okay. And a lot of the clinical literature is just saying, you know, ignore the animal when it's scared. Well, actually, that's 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 not good for the animal because you're not actually acknowledged the fact it's it's scared. And so we have these protocols that whereby, you know, if the dog is scared, what you do is you stop, you orientate to the dog and you say, Fido, you're scared. I can see that you're scared. And again, the literature, I think, is confusing because people say, oh, well, then play the dog, play with the dog and get in. And I'm thinking, no, the... the where people go wrong is they try and shove the toy into the dog's face. Well, the dog is scared. It doesn't want a toy in its face and you shoving a toy into its face doesn't help. But what you can do is you can get some of the dog's toys out and see how good you are at juggling. And I hope you're bad at juggling because what you will do is you will create an ambience where the animal will extract the information and say, well, you've acknowledged that I didn't like this, but clearly it's a playful environment because you're playing. I will now choose to engage with you. And this goes back to what we're talking about, I think, in the first part about brains wanting meaningful information. But you have to acknowledge, first of all, that the dog is scared. And then you create an environment that is an ambience, which signals to the animal that everything is safe. And because you've got a supportive relationship and you don't engage in physical punishment, the animal knows it's safe with you. So you reinforce that. It's, and it's so much easier to teach to people than all these desensitization and counter conditioning protocols, which to be honest, even skilled trainers sometimes aren't very good at. Um, and okay, you know, maybe that's too cognitive or whatever, but 
it's it's that reflection on trying to give the brain meaningful information and as i said i think this idea of it, you know it doesn't just because you believe in using positive reinforcement doesn't mean you don't teach the animal boundaries there are things you know and again one of the things you know i think some of the key things beyond you know the the bait what i've traditionally thought of the physical basics are yeah you want to be a safe haven and a secure base base to your dog you also want your dog to have a behavior that it does without thinking and you train it to do that and it has to be some form of stop drop lie down sit because that will save your dog's life because one day it might be running across and heading towards the road and you don't want the dog to think about it you want that to be like a knee jerk that when you say stop the dog just sits and and then he asks the question why the hell did you ask that why but why did my body stop me you know because that could save its life and it's those simple things and again because you train them away from the problem situation it's so much easier to do uh, it's easier for owners to do in that situation as well but yeah and we do need resilient um i, I had a case actually a, a couple of weeks ago and um you know, and people are saying, oh, well, you know, positive reinforcement is, is good and whatever. These owners had been to a behaviorist who had said, you know, their dog was showing aggressive behavior. And the owner said, well, you know, to stop the aggressive behavior, you know, distract it with food. And basically, this dog had learned that the worse the aggressive display, the bigger the food reward, the better the food reward. And it came to us. And in the week before it came to us, we gave them a diary to keep. And on one day it had 52 incidences of aggression towards the owners. You're thinking, whoa, you know, what is going on here? Um, and it became apparent that, you know, with the best will in the world, somebody using positive reinforcement had created a really quite dangerous animal. So this idea, yeah, that positive reinforcement is always going to be good for the animal. And as you say, these are ethical uh, issues as well. But people need to understand the learning theory and not be afraid of the terms, I think. But sorry, I'm, I'm on one of my high horses. <laughs> I don't know where you want to go with it. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of complicated things. I think, you know, uh, so a few points here. I think there's a cultural thing going on. You mentioned resilience, which is a fantastic mm. thing. We're in a culture right now, at least in North America, where there's a lot of uh, helicopter parenting going on. And you, the, the whole idea is to protect your, your children from any adversity in life, any stress, any everything. And we started to understand in psychology and neuroscience now, uh, not so much ethology, that uh, that's not actually necessarily good because you're, you're, your body, your brain um, will learn to deal with stress only if it's exposed to it, the same way that your immune system reacts to disease only if it's actually been challenged. Um, so it's backfiring on us. We see it with university students, this new generation, you know, that have very poor coping skills, anxiety disorders are out of control. They're at epidemics type level. Um, but you see, it's again, it's this idea to find the right balance. And I'm not saying expose your dog to stress. I'm saying just don't worry too much about the normal stress of life. Yeah. You know, dog parks can be stressful, but don't prevent your dog from socializing because somebody told you dog parks are necessarily bad. Uh, doggy daycares, same thing. Uh, I mean, you know, again, we, we have those pendulum movements where you, we go from one extreme to the other. And I think, again, this is where we're at now. We're, we're in the other extreme where sheltering our dogs from the normal stresses of life. It, and by the way, I'm not, this is not a comment for force-based training at all. No. It, it, it's, you know, and, and part, I think, of the the premise that you you brought here is is based on something I wrote a number of years about a number of years ago in a in a, uh, in a, a blog about is it okay to say no to your dog hmm. right which is just a big uh, big issue with with some trainers at least and I think now that I look back at that piece of writing I'm realizing I I I would write it differently now because I think it was interpreted as um, uh, you must, uh, how can I say this? 
it, let, let's put it this way. I was kind of suggesting that sometimes learning is as much about pruning out irrelevant information as it is to uh, acquiring new information. And it's not about really saying no as much as helping the dog to understand what you just did there. That didn't work out. Stop doing that because uh, you're wasting your time. You're not getting treats. If you did this instead, this would be better. Hmm. That's not punishment. That's yeah. information. It's meaningful information. So, but it's not punishment, right? So, so Ian Dunbar, I remember, you know, because he was a big influence on me. Well, he still is with, with good friends. But, um, but he talks about instructive reprimands. Your tone of voice tells the dog it's done wrong the content tells it what it needs to do to do right mm -hmm. you know so you know and and that can work you know and that works very well as opposed to saying no because no just stops the dog and it goes off and does something else wrong um but the instructive reprimand and i think it is important yeah you know i always found it weird with the animal welfare legislation it was freedom from everything you know and it was always a very very negative way of looking at things and as you say the idea of welfare was that, well, we have to avoid these stresses. And actually, you know what? Shit happens. What we need to do is we need to bring up children and dogs and cats and horses to cope with the normal stresses. There are thresholds of things that are unacceptable that we should not be doing. Absolutely. And that's the key thing, you know? There are certain practices that are unnecessary um, they may be effective, but they are unnecessary, but we can still build resilience by building up the confidence. I mean, one of the, I'm actually, anyone who's watched um, many of these, they'll notice I'm in a different room and I, I'm, I'm actually in my, uh, one of my son's uh, old bedrooms and we've converted it partly so that there's less noise because I was used to be downstairs where it was more open. But just outside the window here, when the kids were young, I built them a platform in the tree just outside here. And I deliberately built it slightly rickety, not because I wanted my kids to fall out, but I wanted them to have a challenge. Now it did, it did backfire because they went up about twice and then said, this is too scary. And I've actually just, just last week a bit fell off it. Well, that's 20 years since I've built it. I don't know, probably. Um, so it was pretty safe, but you know, I wanted them to challenge themselves. And that's the thing, let them challenge themselves and know that you're there to support them. That way you can build resilience. You know, let an animal know that if it needs help, and this goes back to that, you know, secure base, take it into a situation like a dog park and read the individual. Again, and going back to what we were talking about in that first part, you know, that people were talking about nomothetic versus ideographic. That they, people want the general rule, dog parks are stressful for dogs, don't take dogs to dog parks. No, take use dog parks to build your dog's resilience, but don't take your little Bichon Frigé who is 16 weeks old and let it loose in the dog park with the Cocker Spaniel, the Great Dane, the Labrador who has no social skills whatsoever and you can see is bundling over anything that vaguely walks in, but is having a whale of a time. You know, be more thoughtful and look at the world and use the world to build and build confidence and resilience and things like that. And yes, there are stressors there, um, but it's about, it, it, yeah, operating at the threshold, sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's, it's again, it's not all or none, right? It's just mm. not, it's, it's not, uh, and, and, and I think sometimes as dog owners and dog trainers and, uh, and, and, and as parents as well is, uh, it's on us to give some structure and there's a nice way to do it there's a not so nice way to do it that leads me to another comment i wanted to make i, I think one thing that we don't discuss uh and i've had that conversation in fact at the action conference two years ago in birmingham i brought it up and uh, some people got it others didn't uh but i think what we forget is that the people that use the force approach there's a history there. And what I mean by this is, I think we forget that uh, the, the human, the human behind this. And uh, what I mean by this is, I think uh, we, we are often too harsh judging the people that 
use methods that we don't like. Uh, and probably because I, I was a victim of very strong, very extreme emotional and verbal abuse when I was a kid, I think we forget that a lot of those people reproduce patterns that they're, I wouldn't say comfortable with, but that they've experienced. Yeah. And, and I think we, we, go at, we, we go about it the wrong way. We, we make it about, oh, it's the wrong technique. And I think we should say, no, it's the wrong way of building a relationship. And this is why we should educate. We should, we should try to understand where they come from. Because I strongly believe, and there's a study to do there. I just don't have the courage to get into it. But there's a study to do there. Why is it that some people use forest-based methods? And I guarantee you, it has a lot to do about how they were raised. So there is a study going on at the moment from, funded by the Leverhulme Foundation. Um, and it's some social scientists who are looking at the culture of the use of punishment in dog training. Oh, great. Um, I think they're based at Warwick. Um, I'll have to look it out. I've not seen anything come out of the group yet, but I saw a couple of years ago, this was just before COVID, I, I saw that they'd got this award and I was thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> I wish I'd had that idea. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but I managed to write that grant because, yeah, I think it's a really Im important uh, point, as you say, that yeah, many of these people may be victims. And I, I went to a, a school that I went to, you know, it had a very macho culture and I'm quite small and slight. Um, and I, I didn't even- You're about my size, I remember. I didn't, <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't even try to play the game. And I, you know, just, you know, stupid things like people had certain seats on the bus. And in, in those days, you know, the, 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 so the most senior ones were at the back of the bus and the most junior would be at the front. And people would pile in because they wanted to get a seat because there weren't enough seats in that section of the bus for, you know, for that age group. And you'd sometimes have people sitting, you know, on a double seat on a bus with three of them in that seat and then three on the opposite. And there'd be some empty seats at the back. And the prefects would occasionally come down and say, well, there's some empty seats. You, we can fill them up. And I thought, well, I'm not going to get involved in this big crush and fight for seats. I just waited till the end. And then I'd be the last, so I'd be sitting on the end and there would be a seat at the back of the bus. So I didn't have to fight for it, you know, and I just thought, but it, but, um, but anyway, sorry, I go a, a, off track. But yeah, it was a very macho and, and quite violent um, culture. And, you know, that was the way that it was, you know, it, it was the, the thought that that's the way that done. And people say, well, you know, I, I came out tougher for it. Yeah, but I look at a lot of my classmates and, you know, it was a, academically, it was considered a very good school. And, you know, a number of us managed to get scholarships and our parents were very proud of that, et cetera. So all of the people who got scholarships actually went to that school very, very bright. And I looked to see their academic performance and they didn't realize it. And, you know, yeah, some some did very well. I did I, I did pretty well. I did well enough to get into vet school, etc. But I did it in spite of the school, not because of the school. And yeah, you know, yeah, you might say it's toughened me. I'm not sure it did toughen me up. You know, I think it explains a lot of some of my hang-ups. But that's another story. And it's that you know, it, it, it's that idea that sort of well, it didn't do me any harm. Well, you know, that isn't the, the score. There's a great book called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, it's written by a psychologist who, yeah, look, looks at, um, you know, how uh, the effect of abuse, it's, it's, it, it's not a book for those that are of a sensitive predisposition, because there's some real horror stories, this guy, but it, he also does talk about the science and the difficulty of getting uh, funders to actually recognize that we need to look at the long term effects and go back into these histories of what is going on. Um, and it I mean, I, I don't know if this is an urban myth. Um, it, it's, it's, I'll just throw this out. I just thought about this. Somebody told me once that in Australia, they had a problem with speeding. And um, they, they tried various campaigns to try and reduce speeding. And they just hadn't worked. And then somebody came up with this idea of they had this sort of lad in a car showing off going fast and then these two girls just giggling and then going like this. Now people are going to watch the video. You know? <laughs> sort of, 
um, you know, speeding was basically a uh, manhood extension because they were inadequate. And apparently that was the most successful campaign for reducing speeding because they suddenly turned it on its head. Yeah. And I just wonder if in the dog training world, if we turned it on its head and said, you know, these people who are using force free, they're poor people who've probably been abused as kids. And I just wonder if we might make more progress that way, that people start to think, oh, oh hang on, you know, and, and turn it on its, its head. And as you say, there's a much bigger cultural issue here that we perhaps need to think about. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, and, and as a victim of abuse, there's two ways to react to it. Uh, well, maybe three, but uh, either you, you, you react to it, you really fight it back, you say, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to do this to my kids. I'm not going to mm -hmm. do this to my, to my dogs. That was my path. It, it involved therapy and a lot of work. I'll tell you in a minute exactly how I realized I had to do this. Or, or the one that's unfortunately probably the most common, which is to say, I'm going to reproduce those, some, the, the same patterns. In fact, you don't even think about it because again, that's what you know, that's what you're comfortable with. You think it works. I went through it, they can too. It will just make them more resilient, whatever. All, all kind of rationalization and justifications for it. But uh, so I think the, the, the extremes can also be explained through a history of abuse, uh, e either response, either you are force free or exactly the opposite. For me, I, I mean, I remember exactly when it clicked in my head. Um, I was adopted. And as soon as I was four years old, my parents told me I was adopted. Uh, and at home, it was my mother that was extremely um, uh, abusive uh, verbally and um, and emotionally. And uh, I remember one year she, we had a dog, a, a, a beagle that she had a really hard time house training. And she just gave up one day and said, okay, that's enough, I can't take it anymore. And she left uh, without me even having a chance to say goodbye with the dog to bring it to the vet. Uh, I don't know what happened, if it was to get it euthanized or what the story was that it was given to somebody that, you know, um, a farmer that had a farm and she was living in her farm all happy but i don't buy this <laughs> explanation yeah. it's a typical story right mm. so um and uh i was i think five years old when at one point as it was a almost daily occurrence my mother lost it on me and she said if you continue like this if you don't smarten up we'll return you to the orphanage so for a five-year-old guy uh, it's terrifying because first of all, I had the experience of the dog being returned, you know, being sent back because it didn't do what she wanted. So I took it seriously. That's the kind of emotional verbal abuse that I went through. But it took me to get to my mid twenties as I was having my first dog. I came back one day, came back home and uh, she had a bit of husky in her, so she was a little bit hot under cotto sometimes, and, and I would say she was intense, let's put it that way, and she got in the garbage and had strewn the garbage uh, all over the house. And I just lost it on her. Now, I, not in a physical way, but I started going, you're stupid. What did you do? Uh, all the kind of things my mother used to yell at me. I'll return you to the pound, you know? And I was like, and then I stopped myself as I was yelling this at her and thinking, what the heck are you doing? And I realized I just was reproducing exactly the same kind of patterns that my, you know, that I had learned from my mother basically. And I got terrified, started crying. I apologized to her. It was, I think the first time I ever had you know, exploded that way with, with that dog and the last time as well. And uh, a week later, I was going in therapy. I decided that's it. I'm not going to do this to this dog, to friends, to kids, to my children, to whatever, ever again. But you see how many people have the chance to, to realize this? I, I don't know. And unfortunately, uh, it, it, there's a need there. You, you need help. You, you can do it on your own, I think, I believe. And again, I, I, I have a suspicion, I'll be very curious to see what are the results of that study, that uh, th this is a loaded issue 
with developmental history here that is extremely relevant in that world. And I think we don't talk enough about it. And the reason I'm mentioning this, to be very clear, is the way I see uh, some trainers that still use those old force-based methods, how they're bullied. You see, and that's the worst thing that you can do because you're literally walking right into uh, what, what got them where they are now. You're using the same tactics. And it's sad to see that people that are often self-proclaimed force-free trainers are so good at bullying, are so good at you know, using exactly what they technically should be against. I and think, I think this is so counterproductive. It's one of the things I chat actually sort of to my sons about in particular. And, you know, that we, we, I'm, I'm pretty, I like to think we're pretty liberal here. Uh, and what that means is we can discuss anything. And, you know, we will discuss anything at the table. I <laughs> just say, I do say to them, don't do remember you can't have these conversations at your girlfriend's house the first time you meet the parents, you're not going to go down very well. But I think it's really important. And, you know, and I thought it was really important that they always, my mum had a lovely expression. And I think this is a really, if everybody can do this, you know, I may not love everything you do, but I'll always love you. And that, you know, uh, and, you know, I only heard her say that a couple of times, but she didn't have to say it because it was there. Yeah. And I, I, I did go off the rails a little bit as a teenager, not as bad as, as many, but, um, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, and I, well, I also know I was very, very privileged, you know, if, if my dad had been a minor rather than a veterinarian, I think I probably had ended up in jail, you know, simply because of, well, my father was a respectable member of the community. So we'll just tell him off, you know, um, and there's all that sort of injustice. God, this is becoming really personal, isn't it? Um, but yeah, we joke about this militant liberalism that you are evil if you so much as think these thoughts, you know? And these people are hysterical and they're preaching liberalism and they're screaming in your face that if you so much as think about this issue of, um, you know, whatever I won't I won't give examples because I don't want to fuel people up but you know the sorts of things I'm talking about then you're evil and you know I think this explains why people like Trump were successful because people were thinking well I think these things but I don't act on them but I'm being told that I'm wrong to even think about it and I can't control what goes through my head you know and I've, I've, I'll say this because I've, I've said it to my sons you know I, I haven't done for a while but I have, in our family, there's a big history of suicide. And I've, in the past, often thought about suicide, but I've never acted on it. I've never wanted to act on it. But I've explored the ideas and those sorts of things. And I don't think that necessarily makes me vulnerable because I actually could articulate it. And by saying to people, well, you know, you've thought about it, oh, you know, you could actually make matters a lot worse. You've got to give people the space to explore these things. Um, and as you say, you get people who are absolutely extreme in their views. And yeah, as you say, they are complete bullies. You know, this person should be destroyed because they said something on TV and whatever. And you just think, here you are saying you want to advocate positive reinforcement and you are, you know, where have you, where have you lost it? Um, and, I think, and yeah, and all, of all the things, you know, from from trainers, people that shouldn't understand the principles of learning. I mean, you don't you don't train uh, or teach by belittling and you don't learn by being belittled. So it, it should be self obvious that this is not the right approach. If you want somebody to to immediately close down and stop listening, bully them and belittle them. That's that's that will work. But but you're ending the conversation as soon as you start doing that. And I don't understand that force-free people don't get that. You know, if, if you preach positive reinforcement, uh, use it. Um, just, you know. Nudge them, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, and I hold my hand up. I've been gu as guilty of that as anybody, you know. I, I don't mean to belittle. I have a, yeah, my sense of humor can be sarcastic and people with them, you know, if you, 
if you misjudge it with a client, it goes down like a lead balloon because, yeah, they take it as belittling. But I actually, you know, and I say to the student, you know, one of the things you've got to do working in this field is you've got you've got to be true to yourself because, you know, yes, you can learn certain skills and you should use those skills and improve it. But again, you know, none of us are perfect. I like to use humor because I want to take away the stress from people. Mm -hmm. And so I do use humor and I try to make light of things. And there is a fine line there. Um, I'm not recommending that everybody uses humor or whatever. That, that's just my style. I try to do that, you know. And I also feel that if I can use humor with a client, you know, we've got a rapport, they're more likely to engage. I, I freely admit sometimes I get it wrong. And, you know, that's not good for those clients. Uh, you know, and I... I I've become better at picking it up, but you know, sometimes I do open my mouth with that before I've, I've thought <laughs> I've done frequently this afternoon, but, um, but yeah, you know, and yeah, there was a lot of belittling went on in my childhood as well. And that's probably why it's sort of, you know, sarcasm was a, a, a sense of humor. Um, you're also, you're also British. <laughs> you are, yeah, that's true. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'll use that excuse. Thank you. <laughs> That's that North American politeness. Let's do our stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, <laughs> no, but I think it's, I think it's a really good point that, yeah, you, and um, I'm really glad that we've dis discussed that, that actually, you know, if hopefully people listening to this might think twice. And again, you know, the echo chambers of Facebook, I don't agree with you, unfriend you, never want to hear from you again. And I think that's so unhealthy. Um, you know, it's the, the hope with social media is that we could we could discuss, we could, you know, you, we could have debate, debates, discussions. Uh, but I think it it kind of didn't work, does it? I mean, in a lot of groups now, what I see is it it's um, we have a word in French, chicane. It, it becomes it it becomes um, fights essentially uh, very quickly, and uh, I'm right, you're wrong, and immediately it's you know. And I think, I think there's, a, there's isn't there that formula somebody says sort of on on social media, sort of something like within twelve steps somebody will mention Hitler or the Holocaust. You know? <laughs> it's, just sort of, it's just one of those things that you know somebody makes that sort of accusation as soon as it, it so quickly gets down to that level. You know, you're well, a fascist or. And we're back in the shades of gray, right? I mean, it's mm. just I, I mean I think the woke movement did a lot of good things. But, you know, it also sometimes goes too far where we are too quick at judging people that are not exactly the, the picture perfect uh, mm -hmm. idealization that we have of what it is to be woke, I guess. Yeah. And, and this is counterproductive because and there's also, no more dialogue. There's no more dialogue. Right? And also judging people's past by, you know, by current standards. And, you know, I'm glad that people didn't have smartphones when I was a kid. You know, and just because somebody said something and just because somebody said something, that doesn't mean they believe it as well. You know, there's that rush towards, well, they said that. So they must believe all of these other things. Well, they just said it. It may have been a slip of the tongue. It might be something they think about. Educate them about it and see if they move on. And there is no shame in making mistakes. You know, that I often say to the students, you know, I'm a professor because I make a lot of mistakes and I learn by it. That's called being a good scientist. You do this, it doesn't work. You try something else, you move on. And you shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. And okay, you know, fair enough. If you've got a dog or a cat, you've got a sentient being. You don't want to make mistakes that are going to cause that physical harm. But again, you know, clients sometimes say, you know, I lost it and I felt feel so bad. I say, we all lose it occasionally. It doesn't matter. You're not going to wreck the animal by occasionally losing it. You know, you were pushed and you're in that situation. Just walk away, you know, and that's fair enough. But don't beat yourself up over it because actually that makes it harder for you to cope in future. And yeah, I mean, trying to remove people's guilt about being human. You know, it's OK to make mistakes. Um, you know, and the psychology of this is interesting because I think social media, because there's that kind of distance, it's a lot easier to throw out there whatever you want and walk away from it indeed. And, you know, but, you know, I've seen a lot of debates uh, go really, get really intense between two people. And then finally they're next to each other at a conference and they're awfully nice to each other. Mm -hmm. And I realized, yeah, we, we missed that that one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, which is really important actually, because people are much less aggressive 
if they're physically close to the person that they're, they're mm. debating with or discussing with. And, you know, in terms of uh, mistakes, making mistakes and being called on those mistakes, I made one recently, a bad judgment. Uh, unfortunately, what happens, some people started getting really aggressive with me. And the, the human the human response to this is often to get very defensive. And I did. It took me actually a few days before I could actually process what people were telling me. And then I went, yeah, they're right. I need to apologize and I need to go fix this. But it's not, again, by, by telling people you're wrong, it's this is horrible, you shouldn't have said that, you should not have done that, you, et cetera, that you go anywhere. I mean, at, I mean, you can say you shouldn't have said that or done that and explain why and be polite about it. But, but on social media, that's not what happens. Usually mm -hmm. it's, it's a blanket judgment, very radical, you're an awful person, go away kind of thing, and that's it. And that's not the right way to do it. No. And again, if those people were abused or, and are abusers, uh, you're, you're, you're pushing all the wrong buttons or arguably the right ones, depending on how you see the situation. And it, it's not making it better. It makes, it makes it worse and makes those people more likely a lot of them at least to respond even more aggressively to this and close down even more to the arguments you're trying to make. I mean, we've seen this just in the last year with the rise of Trump in the US and all the discussions about the pandemic and, and freedom and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's sadly get out of hand, getting out of hand, I think. And social media has a lot to do with, with this. I, I wish sometimes we could go back to the good old days where uh, you had to grab the phone or go see the person or write a letter. Yeah, writing um, a letter. Remember that? Yeah, writing a letter, right? That's <laughs> that's just, I mean, it's that, that process is fantastic. And this is what I try to do now with social media is I read, I don't react right away. I go write something in a word processor. I think about it. I edit it. And then I copy paste when I'm satisfied with it. That's, that's the only way to so that's why you always come across as so eloquent. And that's why I said at the beginning well, about sort of, I find you intimidating because you always seem to be so thoughtful. And that's because you've put it in a Word document and slept on it. Well, maybe not always, but, you no. know, it's yeah. it's often when it's, I know that this is going to be a bit of a, you know, uh, involved conversation. Yeah, I, I've learned yeah. this, but it took me a long time to, to learn to do this. Uh, yeah. A good, good decade before I started doing that. And I got myself in trouble by reacting and often re uh, uh, responding in kind, which is I thought initially was the right thing to do in debates. But then I realized, yeah, no, yeah. when when the person goes a bit too far and you follow, that's just that's where, again, the communication stops and the learning stops as well. So yeah. no point in doing that. Have you still got any time, by the way? Because I know we've been chatting a long time. But Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. So, it's, it's, so one other topic just for the. I, I just think would be interesting to explore is the uh, your take on dominance um, because again it's something one of those things that is so commonly misunderstood uh, and I always like to hear people's articulations and the, uh, one of my friends Gary Landsberg he tells the story of once having to go to give a talk on the condition formerly known as dominance in dogs because he wasn't allowed to use the word dominance you know it, again, it's it sort of it got all these wrong connotations. Um, and I think people are starting to reuse the term perhaps a little bit more accurately and understand what it is. Um, but I'd love to hear your take on, yeah, your take on it and in, particularly in relation to the dog world and the misunderstandings that have happened because I have read some of the stuff and I, I actually give the students a, a lecture on on this and I think oh there's a, some extra points there that of misunderstandings that I perhaps haven't picked up on so yeah I think the first thing is I, I see first of all my my PhD was on um, reproductive suppression in wolves and it was based on the social theory that Sapolsky and others uh, McEwen um, and others put forward the idea that through aggression through dominance actually the um, the breeding couple that we used to call the alpha male and the alpha female, uh, behaviorally or physiologically, maybe through pheromones, suppress the, the others. Uh, uh, because in a wolf pack, it's only the dominant, well, what we used to call the dominant male and female that reproduce and not the others, right? Uh, at least that is true. And that's an important point in multi-generational packs. So extended family packs. It's a different story with nuclear family uh, kind of system that you find in some wolves. 
here's the thing. First of all, I think in wolves and dogs, it's different. So what I know the most about is dominance in wolves, where again, on both sides of this issue, it's been massively misrepresented, in my opinion. Uh, in dogs, I don't know. I, I think I, I'm an observer of the literature here. I read it. I see what the Italians have done. I've seen what the Austrians, uh, Austrians are doing now, especially in Morocco. Um, I think dogs are a lot more complicated. I think there's this idea, there's more fluidity as well in dogs. You know, it's maybe less structured, but again, more fluid. Is there real dominance? I don't think so, not the way that we conceptualize it in most other social carnivores, let's say. Um, and so we, just it, in relation to that, we recently, well, I say we, I, I'm a co-author on a paper with largely led by one of my um, colleagues who's now in Poland, Margazata Pilot, where she's been looking at the free roaming dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, what the interesting stuff is because they did the genetic work to look to see what is the makeup of these free roaming packs. And the first thing is the there's polygenandry going on you know the the males are multi mating with multiple females the females are mating with multiple males the, um, and the litters are have multiple fathers in them as well so there is that going on and so okay not not, the, not like walls at all then yeah exactly yeah. and then and, and this and i think this is really important and okay these animals are being given a bit of supplemental food as well so food is not a resource that is restrictive and that is probably what allows the female and again i think it goes back to what we were at the very beginning we were talking about nature nurture that people think that this species operates in this way and that it's ingrained that you know animals only have the one way, but they adapt to the environment. And mm -hmm. if you provide the resources, so you say about, yeah, you've got the stuff going on in India. Yeah, I think if you've got very different ecologies and you will get different social structures and mating systems as a result. But sorry, I'm jumping. Yeah, uh, no, no, that's fine. And, and, and that that is exactly actually where, I, again, I think we are losing the nuances in this debate. So, you know, people, so there's a lot of, mythology out there and unfortunately some scientists are responsible for spreading more of it uh, and it amazes me because it seems that nobody or very few people are actually reading the papers they're citing when they when they do this so often people will say well the person that uh that invented the concept of dominance is the one now that that change uh, its mind about it so they talk about david meach or first of all david meach is not the one that came up with dominance mm -hmm at all. I mean, that theory came up way before Meech with Schenkel, Chrysler, and many others. Mm. It, 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 it didn't come up with it. At the same time, as uh, Roger Abrantes and uh, Mark Beckhoff and myself have pointed out many times in, in seminars and blogs and, and publications, uh, he has not actually repudiated the concept of dominance. He has repudiated the concept of alpha male and alpha female. And the reason is that you need to really understand what he was talking about. It's mostly in reference to his 1999 paper on the Arctic wolves in Ellesmere, a different ecology than what you would find, let's say, on Il Royale in Minnesota or uh, Michigan or some of the other states where he also did some research, where he does still to this day talk about dominance. And here's the thing that people miss. There's a difference between packs. Not all wolves are the same. So it's ecology, it's social structure, and the social structure is often correlated with the ecology. So some wolves live in nuclear families, uh, or what we call also immediate families, uh, mom, dad, and the pups of the year. In that structure, there's no dominance hierarchy simply because there's no other adults. Mm -hmm. And young wolves don't get into the politics of the pack until they get at sexual maturity at one or two year old. So there's no dominance hierarchy to have in that context. Yet in the 1999 paper where he describes that social uh, structure in wolves uh, in, in, here in Canada on Ellesmere Island, interestingly, he makes a comment about how the parents have a very firm hand or paw, I, I should say, I guess, on the pups. 
And I remember when I read that in 1999, I remember thinking, oh crap, the dog uh, trainers that are for force-based methods are going to get all over this. Interestingly, it's not how the paper was understood. And immediately paper said, it's an anti-dominance paper. It's not, he never says in that paper, in fact, that that's what he's, he's saying. What he puts forward is actually a theory that Robert Hind at Cambridge, and then later on, John Fentress here uh, in Halifax uh, put forward with wolves, which is role theory. Instead of thinking about ranks and status, think about the role of each individual in the group. So in a nuclear or immediate family, you're the parent, you take care of the young, the young are not in the dominance hierarchy yet, and when they are getting to sexual maturity, they will disperse. That's usually how it works. If you look at multi-generational packs that we call also extended family packs, what you get there is something very different. You'll have the young of the year that are all from the same male and female that we used to call the alpha male and the alpha female, or let's call them here the reproductive uh, reproducing couple as Mitch would like us to do. And uh, the problem now becomes what to do with the others. And that's the whole question of my PhD thesis was, well, that becomes a problem because only one pair can breed in a pack for it to be sustainable in most cases that we know of. In fact, in wild and captive packs where a second female gets pregnant, usually what happens is the female that gets at the top of that hierarchy will usually go and kill the pups of the second female. And, and that is the essence of a dominance hierarchy in wolves. It's actually not that much about the food resources. It's, at, it's more about the access to reproduction. That's where it comes, uh, it comes to, So, which is a totally different story with dogs. Dogs don't really necessarily think about it in terms of production. Uh, in fact, I don't know that dogs think about that at all, but that's, anyway, it's another issue. So in extended family groups, there is, there is a, a need for order. And this is the thing that people don't understand is dominant CRKs in the animal kingdom. It doesn't matter if it's crayfish, um, uh, birds or, or mammals. It's about reducing conflict, not about creating conflict. It's about reducing conflict. And it's a way of saying, look, this is what I do. This is my job. Uh, have sex with this individual and, and have babies and we all raise them together because all you guys that are not the breeders here are going to be um, helpers, right? Because wolves are cooperative breeders after all. And what's interesting is that uh, even with captive studies that we did, the dominance hierarchy becomes quite salient in multi-generational or extended family groups during the reproductive season but only during that time, before and after. So from let's say uh, uh, mid-March until probably late December, early January of the next year, what you find is relative harmony within the pack. They play, they have fun with each other. You don't really see that dominance hierarchy. But when the breeding season starts, when the hormones kick in in early January, <laughs> That's when you start seeing like things are getting like this. And it's all about the dominant male or the alpha male and the dominant female or alpha female trying to secure their access to, uh, to the opposite sex. Um, and what we found in our group and this, the, the, the Dutch did as well is that usually there is a dominance hierarchy within females. So females mm. figure out their own politics yeah. and males figure out their own politics as well. And then by default, the two that will win, if you want, in a sense that that political debate will be the one we're producing in principle. Now, we've also done some genetic work. Eric Barr, one of our former master's students uh, at the Wolf Camp, showed that this is not always true. Like the, the, the male that seems to be the alpha male or the reproducer is not always the father. <laughs> Sneak making. So, yeah, exactly. So it, it's, it's, it can get disorderly sometimes and there's some exceptions, obviously. Mm. But so you see, as you pointed out very, very well earlier, now let's look at dogs. Well, dogs are in a different kind of ecology. It's a different social structure, most likely. And you, you pointed out this polygynandry, which is fascinating because as far as we know, 
this is not happening in wolves, or if it does, we don't know of any of it yet that I know of. So they're not comparable. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's this whole issue, obviously, that dogs, uh, do, would they understand the cross-species dominance thing? And it's not just that. I mean, to, just to go back to a very basic idea, I think, you know, we spent between eight to 15,000 years doing selective breeding, active uh, selective breeding to specifically get rid of that animal that could kill you in your, in your sleep or kill the, the, your chickens or, or arm your children. You know, we, we spent a, many thousand years getting rid of those behaviors. So I don't think it's relevant to dog training. I don't think it's relevant to dogs that much anymore. Um, so I agree with everybody that says, yeah, dominance theory based training, we should retire that stuff. Absolutely. But we should not deny the science and the facts that there are some dominance hierarchies in wolves. They, they exist. Yeah. Not all wolves, not all packs. Again, as we often say in science, it depends. And a good friend of mine, Ray Coppinger, used to say, there's not even evidence that they have the cognitive capacity to understand dominance hierarchies. Well, actually, I would say thank you to the Europeans. We know that that's not true. They have the cognitive sophistication to understand dominance hierarchies. And like I said earlier, there's dominance hierarchies in crayfish. So you don't have much of a yeah. nervous system there. I mean, you do, but I mean, certainly not as sophisticated as ours. Yeah. So again, it's not all or none. It's not that dominance hierarchy doesn't exist, that yeah. dominance does not exist. The question is, in what condition, with what species, for what purpose? Again, it's shades of gray. And again, I think it's that failure to understand what dominance means in a biological context, that if it is, it's about yeah, reproductive access. And if you're talking about new to dogs, then it's, it's a mute point. You know, you can have disputes and you can construct a hierarchy, but it's not in the same league because it's not, there's, this can't be the same ultimate goal at the end of it. I, I remember sort of when I first moved into academia and I, I sort of um, I had to deliver this course and I just sort of bought whatever books I could and you know it was, it was about horses and the saying you know people say oh well horses aren't territorial and then there was this one paper and it's one of the islands of Canada where the horses are territorial and oh, the, the, Sable the, Island. Yeah, and and it's it, because it's, it's, the, the geography, it's, it, yeah, yeah, the geography allows for it. The, mm -hmm. That's where you are, is it? Or you... It's it's in Nova Scotia. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just uh, so yeah. so you know, and and it it was sort of brought home to me this idea that you know yeah people labeling species as being territorial or not. Mm -hmm. I think well, what it tells you more about is where the animals live, not about the biology of the animal, and you know that's the thing for us to appreciate is that yeah there's enormous flexibility um and yeah we are shaped by our environments and but our biology will have the evolution will have selected us to be adapted to it this it's actually really it's almost as if we planned i think it's a nice way of wrapping things up it takes us back to where we were but it's you know it is all nature and nurture and it's not one or the other and we've got to get out of these simple dichotomies and actually, you know, it's what makes it interesting is going into these issues, I think. I mean, that's what I, I love as a scientist. Yep. And, and is it not actually fascinating that, that wolves would not be that predictive? You know, that in some environments, they, they develop a strong muscular dominance hierarchies and in others, they don't at all. Mm. You know, and, and I think that's fa fascinating, but somehow we want to have a one mold, uh, it, one model fits all, right? This mm. idea of, no, no, it's, it's that or this. And it's, it, no, it's, they're more complex than we think. They are a lot more complex than you than right. we think we perhaps don't yeah. give enough attention to the idea of culture in animals as well you know well yeah. and as you know i i'm a kind yeah. of a fan of this idea yeah. i think you know all the work by hal whitehead here at dalhousie mm -hmm. actually on culture in wales is something that that um translates very well actually to social carnivores to primates obviously that a lot of that work mm -hmm. started in japan with the uh the uh, primatologist there but uh you're right. I think we we forget this that that animal culture 
is a thing. It, yeah. it, it is. And that adds a level of complexity um, to animal behavior, at least in social species, that is just incredible and fascinating. Yeah, so we need to stop talking about dogs. <laughs> dogs in these circumstances and in these niches, I think is the key thing. I think we probably better end there. I better give you some time. <laughs> it's been lovely to catch up with you. As I said it's been far too long and we will, uh, when COVID is over, we'll have to sort out a seminar or something in um, North America and um, yeah, and sort of catch up. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Thank you so yeah, much for your time. We, we, we went in all kinds of directions here with this, Actually, but it I, was I, some I, I mean, and I, I, I started this uh, in a UK time, um, you know, four o'clock. And I can justify that to my employees because I think the first hour that or whatever the first session was, I'm going to use that in teaching. I think there's some great discussions there for students to pick up on some of those issues. Um, and I hope your students do as well. Um, because I think there's some really good, uh, yeah, it was, it was lovely to get a chance to discuss those things. So thank you so much for your time. We, we can thank the pandemic for this new format as well, which I think is, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely great way of, of it, it also brings, speaking of students, a, a different appreciation for them of, of uh, what science is about. So what, what scientists do beyond the scenes, right? Or like you said earlier, uh, at a conference, when we have that beer or that coffee and, and start chatting about stuff, this, this is- Yeah, this is what we like do. This. And yeah, isn't, exactly. isn't, it, isn't it a great profession? We get paid for doing this, you know? Uh, you know, and I think, so thank you so much. Um, been lovely to catch up with you and I'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you Not very much. Cheers, bye.